Welcome to the Social Engineer Podcast, the Human Element Series. This is episode 250, if you can believe that. I'm Chris Hadnagy, CEO and founder of Social Engineer, the Innocent Lives Foundation, and the Institute for Social Engineering. And I've been hosting this podcast since way back in 2009, when we used tin cans and string for podcasting, if you can believe that too. Anyway, as always, this episode is sponsored by our company, Social Engineer LLC. So if you are looking for help in anything to do with the social engineering space, I'm sure if you're a company of any size right now, you're being attacked left and right, uh, whether it's through phone from phishing calls or phishing emails, or nowadays we're seeing an increase in SMS attacks. All of those things are really difficult to try to train your people. And I'm sure that that 20 minute CBT you give to your employees is not working the way you want it to. So if you want some more ideas on how you can keep protected against these things, check out social-engineer.com. You can make a meeting with us, uh, connect with us, and we'll be more than happy to walk you through what we do and how we help people defend against these attacks. You can find it all, including our 2024 training schedule on social-engineer.com. If you like the topic of social engineering and you're just an enthusiast about it, we have a Slack channel with over 1,500 people in it that are there every day talking about pretexting, talking about the different aspects of the psychology of social engineering, human decision making. We even have a job board. I think we've had 12 or so people find work because companies come in and post uh, that they're looking for employees and then people that are in there can apply. So if you're looking for a legal, family-friendly chat, that's us. If you're looking for something else, don't join. Uh, but if you want, you can find this link in the show notes. If you don't see it there, just ping me on LinkedIn. I'll be more than happy to get you the most recent one. But join us there. And everyone who's listening, I want to invite you to go check out innocentlivesfoundation.org. If you're not familiar with that organization, six and a half years ago, we started that nonprofit to help law enforcement agents geolocate and track people who traffic children and create child abuse material. And I'm really happy to say that in the last six and a half years, we've done over 510 cases so far and submitted them to law enforcement. I'm really proud of the work that's being done over there. It is a nonprofit organization. So if you are a parent or caregiver and you want information on how you can talk to your kids about the dangers on the internet, we have lots of videos and other uh, PDFs and things there to help you with that. If you're looking for um, uh, to support us, you can do that either through voluntary volunteering with us as if you want to come and work, uh, or you can do that through voluntary donations. Both of those really could help us. And you can find all that information on innocentlivesfoundation.org. If you like the music on the podcast here, it is none other than the best rock and roll band on Earth, Clutch. So we invite you to go check them out because they're amazing. And if you don't know the story, the lead singer, Neil, helped me start ILF uh, six and a half years ago. So we're huge fans of them and always have been. So give them some love. And last but not least, if you like the information on this podcast, give us a thumbs up or a like. Uh, please, um, you know, you can you can uh, leave your comments as you always do. Give us the uh, suggestions you have for future episodes. We love those. It really helps us to, um, to, to put on more and, and different content that we know you'll like. Okay, let's get to the reason why we're all here today and talk about our guest. Assistant to the special agent in charge, Brad Beeler, has been with the United States Secret Service for 25 years. He currently serves as an instructor and a Secret Service liaison at the National Center for Credibility Assessment, which is the NCCA, at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Over the last eight years in his role, he has trained agents through the federal law enforcement and intelligence community in credibility assessments and elicitation techniques. But prior to arriving at the NCCA, he was a polygraph examiner in Chicago and St. Louis field offices and served on the permanent protection detail of former President George H.W. Bush and numerous foreign heads of state. Over the past 17 years as a federal poly polygraph examiner, Special Agent Beeler has secured hundreds of confessions on high profile investigations, often leading to identification of previously unknown victims of serial offenders of both child exploitation and homicide investigations, which is why you can probably understand why we're so interested in talking to Brad because he holds a close part in our heart to the work we do at ILF. Agent Beeler holds a master's degree in criminology and was previously selected at the U.S. Secret Service Special Agent of the Year for his involvement in combating crimes against children. Widely considered a communications expert in U.S. federal law enforcement community, Agent Beeler has provided countless domestic and international presentations to law enforcement and intelligence agencies seeking to enhance their interviewing programs. Uh, Brad, I can't thank you enough for being on the show with us today. Thank you so much, Chris. It's an honor to be here. I've, I think I've been a listener for 10 or 11 years now, uh, listening to all your guests from Navarro, uh, <laughs> many, many guests and taking that knowledge and thankfully being able to weaponize that and use that in my day to day. Uh, and obviously with your ILF uh, affiliation, 
um, I'm just honored to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, for me, it's so validating to have someone with your career sitting here telling me that you use the stuff that we spew out for 100%. fun <laughs> to catch bad guys. That's kind of amazing. But I want to start uh, at the beginning. Like, w- at what point in your life did you say, I- I'm going to go be a secret service agent and I'm going to hunt people who hurt kids? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe uh, I think I was always that, uh, you know, that cowboy or that sheriff when I was playing as a kid. And then going to college, I studied criminology. And then criminal justice. And I was honored to be able to do an internship with the Secret Service mm. in my undergraduate education. And what that really showed me is it separated the myth from the reality of what the men and women in the organization do on a day to day basis and really show that dual role, both investigations and protection that we do. Uh, and then I think the thing that really blew me away was uh, President Clinton came into St. Louis uh, while I was there and I got to go uh, to one of his protective sites. And I noticed myself almost instantly being more drawn to the agents that were Mm. around him than I was anything else. Um, So that really hit me. Uh, And then I I just saw that the men and women really had to stand with one another because they travel so much. Uh, And that bond, that teamwork, I always was in uh, athletics growing up. So I really liked that team aspect. So thankfully, I was able to get hired and and start in Chicago and uh, almost 25 years in now. Wow. Had a great time. That's an interesting um, uh, thought process, like the fact that, that the teamwork is what drew you to that. So um, maybe this is a setup question, but after you joined, did you find that what you saw was accurate, that, that being on that team, like you guys really draw close as a family? It, it is. If you have somebody that's sick and you're traveling, people will go to the house and they will <laughs> take care of your family member. Um, it is truly amazing, the outreach um, that the agents will do. And, and I mean, you'll even have some of our protectees. Uh, that are so good with what they will do for their agents, especially on the smaller details, uh, because they'll get to know you. But um, I just remember President Bush uh, wouldn't travel on Christmas uh, because he didn't want the agents to be away from their families. Mm. So those are stories that, that people don't hear a lot of times. So that aspect and being able to see these moments in history, Olympics, um, you know, moments in time that you would get to see uh, ha- have been a great ride. Definitely. You know, that's an interesting point, too, because I think those stories, which I wish we could get those out more, they humanize people, right? Because yes. nowadays politics are like so dirty. I hate even talking about them. But when you say something like that, all of a sudden you take this this person and you humanize this figure that most people are never going to get to know, right? But saying like, he didn't want to travel on Christmas so you can be home with your family. That's kind of great. That's really amazing yes. uh, to hear that. Uh, by and large, foreign and domestic, you will see... Uh, we do the United Nations every September. So foreign heads of state come in and we will protect them. And you will see that these people are just like us. Hmm. Um, we just get to see them on a 24 hour basis. Yeah. Um, so it, like you said, it really humanizes them. So for me, I, I, you know, when I think of secret service, I think maybe like a lot of people listening, I think of what you just said, you're protecting the president, you're protecting dignitaries, you know, high, high profile people that come into the country. But it wasn't until actually you reached out to us that I knew that Secret Service got involved in crimes against children. How how did that come about? How did the U.S. Secret Service get involved in crimes against kids? Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. So a lot of people have that view that we are a protective agency and we don't have a dual mission. But in one of the great ironies of history in 1865, Abraham Lincoln signed us into law uh, to serve as an investigative agency. Hmm. So in one of the one of the agents, that was one of his last acts before his assassination. So the agency that would ultimately would have protected him was actually signed into law by him, but for investigative purposes. And it wasn't until 1901 that we took over uh, protection after McKinley was assassinated. And, and since that point, we've had that dual mission. Um, and in 1994, uh, we took on a mission as far as Congress mandated us to, to provide forensic support for the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, obviously founded by uh, Mr. Walsh. And since that point, we've brought everything to bear. We've got a national uh, computer forensics institute in Hoover, Alabama, that's trained over 10,000 local, state and tribal individuals um, on how to do computer forensics all the way up through network intrusion, so on and so forth. And a lot of that is obviously re- regarding child sexual abuse material as far as the, the forensics. Uh, we also have the world's largest ink library, handwriting analysis, DNA, fingerprints that we will bring to bear for NECMEC. But I think where we've really made hay in that time is all the men and women in the polygraph program have done almost 9,000 polygraph examinations on cases involving sexual and physical abuse of children. And last I checked, almost 5,900 of those cases have resulted in admissions and or confessions 
obviously securing hundreds of thousands of, of years of prison for these for these offenders. That, okay, first of all, that number is amazing, 9,000. But now that you have over what sounds like 60% yes. of those lead to a, a confession. Yep. I mean, that's that's amazing work. I mean, considering that, I mean, most bad guys probably know that's not admissible in court, but you get to use that to get them to confess to something that you might not have ever been able to to get them to pay the justice for it. It is, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't think it's kind of counterintuitive that somebody would. So a lot of our cases that we work now are traveler operations where individuals travel to meet uh, what they perceive to be a 13 or 14 year old girl or boy for the purposes of sex um, or cases in which we'll do a search warrant. And in that search warrant, uh, we find child sexual abuse material. Mm -hmm. We will be on scene at the at that moment to provide a polygraph for them to see if they are hands on. Huh. And over the last, I think, 10 or 11 years, 61 percent of those individuals who travel or download are, are hands on offenders. Wow. Walk out, provide an admission to hands on offenders. So that just goes to show you the work that your volunteers are doing at ILF in geolocating these people in a non vigilante way and referring this to law enforcement, that 60 percent of those people either have or have the capability to become hands-on offenders. Um, so the impact is huge. Wow. I didn't know that stat and you kind of just gave me goosebumps um, mm -hmm. sitting here. I, that, that, wow, I need a minute. That's actually really disturbing. Um, it, it does add a serious impact. I didn't know that 61. I mean, sometimes we find these people on the dark web, you know, and all they're doing is just trading this filth and it's just such disgusting things. But now to understand that in the last few years, I, I, do you do you think um, this is not a question we planned on talking about? But do you think that the increase in the uh, the ease of availability of the material is why we're seeing a sixty one percent hands on offender from this? Yeah, absolutely. You can trace almost where broadband internet comes in, and you can see that unfortunately that urge, that natural uh, urge, uh, takes over where the, the broadband internet comes in, whether it be Alaska. You see a huge increase there um, wow. in previously disadvantaged areas uh, that are now getting broadband. You see a huge increase there. And, you know, for instance, South Carolina, and I know you honored uh, the commander, Kevin Atkins, at the ILF uh, conference this year. I believe he told me last year they had over 90,000 cyber tips, uh, which is in just South Carolina, so just in South Carolina. Um, and those are tips that are coming from social media companies, from NECMEC National Center, um, it's just overwhelming to investigators to separate the wheat from chaff. So one of the things that they've done is really be proactive with this and try to get ahead of it so that we can find these people before they abduct a kid. Yeah. Um, because eventually that's what these people a lot, you know, are going to evolve into. That, uh, that, that's really, that's really amazing and, and not in a great way, like the increase, you know, and it's, it's, um, we, at, at ILF and here at SECOM, we've always been kind of uh, haters of pornography, you know, of any kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, that kind of just makes it more disgusting to me, thinking that, you know, you, you can track the abuse of kids to the availability of that material and people looking at it on the Internet is um, you wonder, man, we'll just get rid of it all. Maybe we can <laughs> we can start seeing a decline in this. Right. I know that's a, a yeah. fantasy, but, you know, it's a. Uh, well, it, it used to be back in the 80s, somebody would have to get something mailed from overseas uh, to a mailbox. That's yeah. why postal inspection used to work a lot of these cases. Whereas now you can get on a, a torrent and just download you know, a gigabyte of files. Uh, you can get on the dark web, VPNs, the anonymity associated yeah. with that. Um, unfortunately, makes our jobs a lot harder to find these people and then prosecute them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, even, uh, recently at ILF, we've been finding there's a lot of, um, open web sites, you know, on the clear web that are just hosting in countries that don't care. Right. Correct. So just hosting in, and so they, they, they put links on a uh, mega and Z and they just up, upload their, their filth there and you can send down takedown notices and they're like, yeah, sorry, too bad. You yeah, know, they and don't just, care. They don't care. Uh, which is the brazenness of it to me. Um, which is now, cause I know a lot of people, uh, may be thinking, well, I don't even know how to get on the dark web, but now they're getting it. So you can just find that filth easier, even on the clear web, which just, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how you do your job, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, speaking to that, you know, it's, uh, the, the good thing about, if there is a good thing about the horrors of this is that all of law enforcement pairs up and works together against these cases. Yeah. Um, if you have a second, I'd like to just speak to you about 
you know, highlight that in that Please. one of my colleagues with Task Force Argos in Queensland referred a case to us recently that was one of the most horrific we had ever seen. And despite the case, you know, he was through investigative means, he saw it was actually happening within a specific time zone in the United States. He worked it, he worked it, he worked it. It had no judicial aspect uh, affecting Australia. And he referred it to the Secret Service mm. and our investigative assistants did an amazing job at being able to see something in these videos that they could link back to a big box store that would have been purchased in a very small time frame. And they were also able to get little screenshots and put together a composite po photo of this person's face. And wow. as a result of that, 40 uh, volunteers worked on the weekend, investigative assistants, and pulled credit card receipts and compared that to DMV photos and social media links. And they were able to identify this individual from that composite photo. And within 16 hours, our agents were able to kick in the door. We had two examiners there, cleared the mom. Uh, the, the mail failed and provided admissions to multiple victims. And we'll probably get life in prison as a result of those actions. So what one agent does in Brisbane, Australia, uh, 72 hours later, we're kicking in a door in continental US. Is that, that's my hope is that we, we, we dislike these people so much. Yeah. Uh, that we get the support. The problem is we hate these people so much. So it's very hard to interrogate them. Uh, because yeah. you vilify them, you put horns on them and it's very hard to rationalize, minimize and project their behavior in the room to elicit that information. That's, that's the hard part. Okay. I want to talk about that in a second, but first I just want to kind of highlight this point because I, I love this story. I mean, you have a guy in Australia who will never not get credit. There's no right. jurisdiction for him. His courts or his judges aren't going to, aren't going to do a thing to support this, but he's working, like you said, one of the most horrific things on the planet yes. just so he can get this guy imprisoned. That, that level of dedication is like, it's, it's like the people I see at ILF, right? They have, yes. they, they don't even get named. They don't even, they don't even want their name out there. They don't even get, they don't even want to be recognized for what they're doing. And yet they have full time jobs. They have kids. They have their own families and they come and they do this hard work just so they can see these guys go away. Um, that it's so nice to hear like that dedication exists across the law enforcement field to work together, you know, because uh, I know like in other departments, you know, other, other types of crimes, it, it could be very uh, a siloed, but to hear yes. that, it, you know, internationally, that's a, that's really, that's really encouraging and wonderful to hear that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I want to talk about this, this interview thing, because you brought up a, a fascinating topic. Um, how, so how do you do that? Like you're sitting in front of someone who, I mean, you know, I can only, and we don't need to talk about it because this is a public podcast, but I can only imagine what that guy was doing. The most disgusting things that any human ever has to see or even envision. How do you sit and interview that guy, but just not wanting to pull your gun out? Yeah, it's, it's tough because these are the worst of the worst, right, Chris? I mean, you know, mala in se versus mala prohibita. You know, you look at bootlegging, you look at drugs, you look at things that are, uh, illegal because the laws say they're illegal. Mala and say is it's illegal because all people view this as horrific behavior. Yeah. So you're sitting across from this person and you're like, how could someone do that? And that's, that's gotta be the starting point. I have to try to understand the why, uh, mm. kind of some quotes I, I like to, to look for is, you know, Victor Frankel and uh, Ted Lasso, and you can't get any more opposite than those two people, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. You got an Austrian psychologist who was imprisoned by the Nazis in World War II, but what he talked about is between stimulus and response, there's that space to have control. Mm. And even though the Nazis were, were holding him against his weed, he, he had the ability to control what he did. And that's mm. the way I teach my students is, look, you hate these people. And between what they say, you have the ability to choose your response to get the ultimate goal. And then the next quote is Ted Lasso. He falsely attributed it to uh, Walt Whitman, I think he says, <laughs> uh, you know, be curious, not judgmental. <laughs> and I love that quote because uh, you have to be judge. You, you can't be judgmental with these people because you put horns on them. They're not going to talk to you. It's yeah. going to they're going to shut down. So by being curious and trying to find their why, um, that helps me ultimately get to the what. And the other analogy I give, Chris, is it's kind of like if I asked somebody to interrogate Adolf Hitler, I talk to my students, I go, how? and they say, how could you do that? And I say, you would approach him as if you were approaching Harry S. Truman. Hmm. And what I mean by that is I would want to be Harry S. Truman's publicist. I would want to be his priest. I would want to be his hype man from the standpoint of Harry S. Truman dropped A-bombs. He firebombed Japanese cities. 
So how do I square that? They attacked us first. There's my projection. Mm -hmm. Uh, I minimize it by it would have been a lot more people, Harry, if you wouldn't have done this. I rationalize it by saying they weren't going to give up. And Harry, you didn't use that bomb for greater gain. You had a weapon that had never been used before in life. And yet you didn't use it to take over additional countries. I would have to apply that, that halo and temporarily, sadly, put it on Hitler. For instance, mm. uh, Agent Pira with the FBI interrogated many, many years ago, Saddam Hussein over the course of several months. And it took time, but he got Saddam Hussein hooked on one of his in-laws cookies and he didn't view him as a horrific man. And Saddam Hussein cried when he left. Huh. I mean, that that's what it comes down to is I want people uh, to want on. Uh, my friend says it best. An FBI agent says you know, a fellow polygraph examiner says, I want them to send me a Christmas card after we're done. Hmm. That's hard to square. And, you know, I, I'm sure we can talk about how you guys work with your mental wellness programs. But that's the hard part is because the cognitive dissonance between the person we are in the room and the person we are in our general life, it does have to switch. We have to talk to those bad people. And unfortunately, when you talk to the boogeyman, it's hard not to bring that home. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I would love to have your opinion or your feelings on this. One time I was, um, I was, I was teaching a class on negotiations and, um, interview tactics. And I had a person in there who was a professional interrogator interviewer and they focused on terrorism, something I had not thought about before. Right. Cause I was doing it business, business related. Mm -hmm. And, um, after class we were sitting and talking and, and he said to me, uh, I, cause I asked him, I said, I'd love to talk to you. How do you do it? Right. And he asked me a question. He said, what does a terrorist want? And my immediate answer was they want to kill people. And he's like, no, mm -hmm. he's like, you're, you're not, you're thinking, you're thinking too singularly. Like, what does he want? And I'm like, I'm not getting the question. I'm like, I know he wants to destroy. He wants to see death. And he's like, no, it's like, really sit back and stop thinking about the end result. And I'm sitting there for like a few minutes. And finally I go, he thinks he's pleasing his God. Right. Yes. He's like, so yes. can you understand you want to please your God? I'm like, yes, I can understand that. And he's like, mm -hmm. great. Now you have a common ground. And I'm like, oh, I got goosebumps again. Cause I'm like, no, wait, I, I don't want to have a common ground with a, with a suicide bomber. I don't. Right. And he's like, but you do. If you're going to interview and interrogate him, you need to have that common ground and you just found it. So now when you go mm -hmm. in there, you're talking to him about his beliefs, his God, his motivation to serve that God, not about the horrific resultant of that. So is that how you do that with child molesters also? Yeah. In, in a way, if you were going to be talking to Timothy McVeigh, a, as hard as it is, you would have to talk about Ruby Ridge. You would have to talk about Waco. You'd have to bring up George Washington. If you were interrogating Osama bin Laden, you would have to talk about George Washington, how he was only 3% and how he used his money and how he used his religion and how he fought with unconventional means mm -hmm. to bring down a tyranny, to bring down an empire. It's sick to say that, yeah. right? Yeah. But for that time when you're in the box, you have to. And and it is tough to square. And that mental wellness, especially and not to be sexist, but for men, we have an ego. Yeah. And a lot of times we don't want to say that we need help. Mm -hmm. And we're that canoe that's taken on water and we don't realize till it's too late um, that we we need to step back and we need to do certain things preemptively uh, to, to help ourselves out. So this is going to sound a little odd to say this out loud, but in my head, it feels easier to find a common ground with a terrorist than it does with a pedophile. So how do you do that? Like, how do you find that common ground? Because, you know, I could, uh, not that I would ever commit an act of violence, but I could see having so much faith that you want to express it in such a way, but I can never envision what would make me hurt a child. Yeah, it's, it's definitely next level. And some of it is specific to the age and I'm not, you know, we have hebophilia, which is, yeah. you know, from, uh, you know, puberty to age of consent. And then obviously, uh, pedophilia, which is solely uh, prepubescent interests. It is very hard to talk to somebody that finds sexual interest in babies. Yeah. It, it, it's, you almost have to talk to them like they're a crazy person. But when we rationalize, minimize and project, we can blame their upbringing. We can blame, you know, situations. We can blame stressors. Uh, we can blame, you know, uh, certain developmental patterns. But it's going to be different than a 13, 14, and 15-year-old where I can talk about Jerry Lee Lewis, Elvis, Barbie dolls, mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, there's, I don't want to get into all the themes, but there's a lot of different themes that I could use that the average person is going to hit on a little bit easier than finding an attraction to babies. Um, okay, but you'd amazing. be surprised. These people do have that. Some of them do have that inner guilt and some of them do want to talk. They've just never been identified. Um, they just never, uh, we've never ferreted them out um, yeah. to talk to them. Maybe we're the first person that has ever truly spoke with them about this. And they, they wanted to say it and we just give them the arena to do that. Hmm. So letting someone be heard. Yeah. It's like uh, what, I mean, the old uh, Dale Carnegie to, to be interesting, be interested, right? These yeah. people, they aren't going to tell anybody else that they're molesting babies. Yeah. Right. And they view it as normal behavior, just right. as you view your behavior as normal. They view your behavior as abnormal. Um, hmm. they view their, their behavior as normal. So sometimes they don't mind talking about it. Okay. So the last question before we get to mental health, how, when you, when, when that happens now, when you open the, the, the doors for someone to talk to you, mm -hmm. how do you control your nonverbals from showing disgust or judgment when they're now telling you this horrific desire they have and that they've actually acted on it? How do you not yeah, go, that, what the, you know, just want to puke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I play uh, I, I play a video to my students where it's uh, Joe Rogan at a UFC fight and somebody does a knockout and he goes, oh, my gosh. Right. He gets all amazed. And uh, I play that because I'm like, that has to stay internal because pedophiles, uh, sex offenders, they are used to grooming people and grooming situations. And they are extremely adept at picking up on nonverbals. Like, is this safe for me? Mm. Uh, their amygdala can fire very, very easily. So yes, to me, nonverbals, and as you know, and, and many guests have said, it's not about detection of deception, right? It's about, I want to see detection of reception. Are they receiving my message and completely filtering out what I'm putting out? Mm. Okay. Cause you have, you know, Chris, we, we, we look at verbals and nonverbals sometimes there's more to it than that. It's yeah. lyrics, it's song and it's dance. Yeah. Lyrics are the words. Dance is the nonverbals. The song is my pitch. It's my tone. It's mm -hmm. how fast I speak. It's my volume. I have to be able to modulate that one to keep myself interesting, but also no one screams a secret. They whisper it. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I meet someone for the first time, I want a slightly deeper tone because that's the furthest thing from fight or flight. When I move close and I want, you know, to, to, to I'm at that time to get that confession. I want to deepen my tone once again, but I also want to soften that tone and create mm. an artificial sense of privacy. Mm. Um, so to me, that's what you miss out on. I, I think I had mentioned uh, my buddy who's deaf and for 30 years, he has been the best purveyor of body language. Oh, yeah. And you got to understand why, because he sees text, he sees closed captioning. When I was talking to him as a kid, before we got smartphones, he would have to put the phone on the TTY and the operator would have to speak to me and I would have to speak back. And he would still just get things typed back to him where I would always get the operator breathing life into that conversation. Uh -huh. Yeah. And he never got that, right? Emojis are helping him. Yeah. I mean, emojis are great for him, but all of society has, has returned to the mean in that regard. So that's where I think the missing piece. And, and once again, there's some great stuff out there. Dr. Abby does a great job. Mr. Yeah. Navarro. Um, at, at body language. But to me, the song part of it is so important that, yeah. that pitch volume and people just don't use it enough. I, I love that analogy. That's really, really great. So let's talk about the mental health part because I think this is so important. Um, sure. how, how do you deal? Like, you know, uh, we'll talk about ILFs in a minute, but we don't even like we don't, we have technology. So we block images mm -hmm. and we don't have to inspect the videos like you do. You, you're talking to me about having to go through a video with such fine tooth comb that you're picking out a box or you're picking out a corner or you're picking out reflections in a screen so you can put together. That means you had to watch that video probably dozens, if not hundreds of times. I can't imagine once. How do you go home at night and kiss your kids or how do you have any happiness? Yeah. So, Chris, I'm blessed in that regard. So I never look at any CSAM images personally. I can't because it, it would it would one. I couldn't rationalize with that person. And a lot of times uh -huh. our forensics people will not be the people that are on the ground speaking with these people. OK, same thing with the chatters, Chris, because 
you got to understand you are portraying yourself as a 13 year old. They are sending your photos. You are literally creating a new life. These chatters are. So yeah. a lot of the ILF volunteers, that is very, very hard. Okay. Yeah. So for me, I don't see the images. I don't engage in the chats. I get to come in right at a moment for three, four, five hours and, and play a, play a part. Mm-hmm. So it's easier for me to hit control alt the lead at the end of the day. Hmm. And, and what I found is it really got to me in St. Louis when I was doing two or three of these a week. Um, it, it became to where it was too easy to rationalize, minimize and project for these people. And some of the detectives would pull me aside and be like, you doing all right. <laughs> and I didn't see I was taking on water. Uh-huh. And so I, I, I talked to some of the experts and what they talked to me about is you got to find another outlet. So I started doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And for mm-hmm. me, that was amazing. And I, we have amazing academy down here with Dr. Uh, with uh, Professor Sa, uh, former world champion. And it's amazing that uh, I get to train three or four times a week. And that's that cathartic release for me. Mm. And a couple other things. Uh, one is I never do work at home when it comes to mm. this. Um, I type all my stuff. I don't care if I've got to go up to the coffee shop uh, during COVID, whatever the case may be, I would never type the stuff up at home because it's just too close. Mm-hmm. Um, and also have that, that counseling, have, you know, somebody that, that you can talk to. Yeah. And then for instance, we've got an upcoming traveler op. And what I'll do every night after I talk to somebody is I will not, whether it be I'll go to a hotel or go home, I won't cross that threshold until I, I jump on my phone and play a game of risk. Hmm. To where my brain is thinking I'm doing something else. And that's what I'm left with when I go back to my home. Um, but, but having that anonymous expert, that psychologist that's affiliated with you that can, can be there if you need it is extremely important. And that's something that here in South Carolina, our internet crimes task force has, has really done a good job of. And we haven't seen, uh, issues, uh, since we've adopted those things. That's a unique uh, perspective because a lot of law enforcement agencies that we work with do not provide their people with, with support, you know, mental Correct. support. And that was one thing when I started the ILF that, um, and I had a meeting with the, uh, psychologist over at NICMIC and I asked them the question. I said, I'm thinking of starting this, but how do you guys deal with it? How do your agents deal with this? And she said, we mandate therapy. Mm-hmm. If you do this work and you work here, you have to see a therapist. And I'm like, that's awesome. Like yes. you could do that. I and mean, she's like, yeah, you can do that if they sign up as a volunteer. So that's what we did. One of our first hires was a, was a wellness director. Uh, she's a licensed uh, therapist and that she, and we mandate it. Like if you're, if you're doing the work, you got to talk to her at least once a month and you can talk more, but you at least once a month. And that's for your benefit. It's for your mental health, but it's also for the organization because if you're not healthy, then we want you to take a break. Right. And we've had that happen where. Uh, of course, it's ma- it's real therapy, so she can't ever tell us what people say. But she'll come back and say, "Oh, I think uh, Chris might need a few months just to to relax," you know. And it's always done kindly, but it's like, you know, man, we just, you know, we had a couple of people sadly who stumbled on some things in places that you would think, "Oh, that won't," you know, that kind of content won't exist. And and she had a the one um, of our volunteers had a visceral reaction, like she vomited, and yes. then she couldn't get out of her head. And we just were like, I, "We we need you to go." take a break. Like we need you to go. Right. And it's not because you're bad. It's like, we, we, this cannot be in your head. Like you have to go get help. Right. And for us, that's really, really important because Mm -hmm. like, if you hurt yourself or your family to help others, where's the scale? It doesn't tip, right. It's not, it's not a, it's not a great balancing act because you, if I, if I, if I go save a bunch of kids, but my kids are all falling apart here, it doesn't make me a hero. You know, (laughs) so you got to take care of home first. Right. No, and absolutely. And, and the issue is we think these cases are so big because they are. Yeah. We don't want to walk away from them. Yeah. And a lot of our forensics people have been trained and they have so much money invested in them that, you know what, they, they don't want to walk away from it. Or maybe their agency doesn't want to walk away from yeah. it. But uh, we really need to look out after our people. And it sounds like you guys started that from the get at ILF. We, we did. We did. We, we, it was just by talking to people like you and Nick Mick and having that nice conversations that allowed us to see, Oh, I don't know if I would have thought of that, you know, ahead of time, because, mm-hmm. um, you know, when, even when I was just starting ILF and doing this by myself, I wasn't really focused on, Oh, I need to go see my therapist, you know, which I have right. one, but I, like, right. I wasn't thinking about that. And I would bring it up sometimes, but, um, you know, I would never think, I would never think about mandating that. And now it became a mandated thing. And I see the benefits for, for, for people. Well, now it's, um, now it's more accepted and yeah. cops, we're afraid Hey, if we tell our employer that we're having thoughts or we're having troubles, we're afraid our gun's going to get taken away. Yeah. 
And so that's the added benefit of our egos and then our fear. So having these people that aren't affiliated with your organization anonymously have these quarterly biannual chats uh, is amazing. And, and from, a, from a monetary standpoint, it, it truly is a drop in the bucket yeah. for what you're going to get back. Uh, it, you know, the juice is definitely worth the squeeze. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. This is, this has been a, a fascinating conversation, but I got a couple of questions we always ask. Um, sure. Uh, me, I, I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for a couple mentors in my life, right? Just I can pick out a few people that well, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today if it wasn't for those people. Uh, do you have anybody in your life that you would consider a, a mentor that really helped you to get to where you are today? Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I was extremely introverted as a kid. Uh, it may not seem like that now, right? <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, but uh, in 11th grade, Mrs. Bertrand, Union High School, uh, she was our speech, drama, slash English teacher. She did it all. And she got me into improvisational acting and creative writing and really opened up my bright brain, really got me involved in confidence. And I take a lot of these things that she does, and I have my students do it. Uh, you know, in, in, in our role playing where they bring in words, they have to do yes and games, uh, cause it really builds up the confidence of these students so that when they get out in the real world, they can, you know, they, they can move, uh, accordingly. Um, so Ms. Bertrand, uh, huge shout out to her. Uh, and then my first partner on the job, Brian Leary, um, he's retired now, was our former program manager in Polygraph, but was blessed. He was in Chicago with me and he really showed me. Uh, integrity showed me how to do polygraph and I was blessed to be in the interview room with him on hundreds of cases involving homicide mm -hmm. and child sexual assault and just saw how no moment was too big. And like you said, not showing that reaction, he was just uh San Diego weather every day. It was just <laughs> like that. And uh, uh, I learned everything that I have from, from Mr. Larry. You know, I love the, the, the mentor recommendations you have here because, uh, we rarely get someone to mention like a school teacher. Yeah. Absolutely. To have that big of an impact. And that's really awesome. That's really yeah. great. Have you, have you ever reached out to her and told her how she affected your life? Uh, I, no, I didn't. And, and, you know, cause you don't, it's like your parents. You don't, you don't appreciate it yeah. until 10, 15 years later. You're just like, ah, right. But looking back, that changed everything. Yeah. You know, um, so, so definitely I've, that's I've told Brian, I've told Brian how influential he is. Oh, That's sure. really cool. That's really cool. Um, uh, one of the things we've started doing when I started this podcast is a lot of people that listen are, are mm -hmm. avid readers. So, um, do you have, and it doesn't have to be about our topic. Do you have any books that you yeah. read that you would just recommend? You're like, this is an awesome book. Uh, yeah, I've got, I'll give you three real quick. Um, The Interrogator, uh, by Han Scharf. I don't know if you've heard that. Um, mm -mm. that is an amazing book about a Nazi interrogator, uh, Luftwaffe interrogator during World War II. And I know you're saying is, you know, leave people better off for having spoken with you or interacted with you. You talk about an ultimate example of this. If you were shot down in World War II and you were dropping into enemy territory, what do you think would happen to you? Probably torture. bad things. Yeah, yeah I would imagine torture, it'd be right? terrible. He would go on long walks with these people. He would, the book is truly amazing. And we've adopted a lot of his principles post 9-11 and how we talk to people. Um, but he did such a good job. He did his job. Our people did our job that after the war, numerous airmen that were interrogated by him actually sponsored his visa, his green card, and his citizenship, and he moved to the United States. Wow. So you talk, you talk about just a great way of doing things. Uh, it, it's, it's a hard translation from German into English, um, but the story is amazing. Great book. Um, Spy the Lie by Phil Houston and two of his colleagues are about uh, very senior CIA polygraph examiners. Um, that have done tens of thousands of exams that really take polygraph and turn it more into detection of deception, uh, linguistic analysis. Um, that's one of those books that's just dog-eared for me that I go back to all the time. And uh, also Vanessa Van Edwards, two of her books, Cues and Captivate. She is amazing at first impressions, at that ability to slap hands with somebody and have that primacy effect. Um, a lot of the things you talk about on the show uh, – she she is great at this, and those are really good quick reads as well. First of all, we've never had any of those books recommended, oh, okay, so great. these will be three new ones. The Interrogator sounds like something I just need to read. Like that yeah. sounds really amazing. Han Scharf, great book. Yeah, thank you for for those recommendations, and really thank you for coming on the show today. If if people want to know more about, um, I'm sure we just can't give a link to you, but if, yeah. if people want to know more about being a Secret Service agent or anything like that, how, what, what should they do? Well, it's perfect timing for people that are interested in joining because, uh, you know, we go through these 25 year cycles 
1984, we hired a bunch. I got hired in 1999. Now we're 25 years on. So we have a, a big need for getting quality people. So usajobs.gov um, and secretservice.gov are the two websites that will take you to what we're trying to do. We're trying to get people in a lot of your listening demographic, that 21 to 37 year old range, um, all walks of life, whole person concept in which uh, we want uniform division officers, agents, administrative personnel. And a lot of what we're going to now is these computer type jobs. But I think you're going to be amazed at some of the stuff we're doing. Um, and we are offering some amazing things as far as tuition reimbursement, uh, loan repayment, child care. Uh, for our uniform division, we're offering some bonuses. So we're competing with a lot of law enforcement entities. So now is a great time if any of your listeners are, are interested. As far as contacting myself personally, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. So if you want to leave my LinkedIn link, feel free to reach out to me and whatever I can provide in that forum. More than happy to. Awesome. I will do that. So in the show notes, there'll be a, a link to uh, to Brad's LinkedIn if you want to connect with him. I can't tell you how fascinating this was. You know, I, I, I always promised the audience in the recent months that I'd try to keep these between like 25 and 35 minutes, but we've been going over 40 and I didn't even realize it because oh, okay. you were just really fascinating to talk to. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. And thanks for your work. And like I said, I've learned a lot. I've turned a lot of people onto the podcast and I hear from them that they've learned a lot and they've weaponized that stuff to make uh, these crimes against children hopefully uh, go away as much thank as we you. can. And thank you for the work you're doing, really. I mean, it's a, a hard job, but you are you obviously have made a huge impact. And it's got to feel good at the end of the day to know how many kids you've saved from the horrors of those things. So thank you for doing that. All right. Much appreciated, Chris. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you all for joining us this month. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the episode as much as I did. Join us next month for another amazing guest on the Human Element series. Until then, stay safe and secure. See you.